Well, good afternoon. <laughs> Hi, Dave. Well, let's stand as we gather. This afternoon, we're going to read through Psalm 84 together. Glorious Psalm. Out abiding with the Lord. And I read the black and we read the white together. To the choir master, according to Giddeth, a psalm of the sons of Korah. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars. O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. Ever sing your praise, Selah. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways of Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Selah. Behold, our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Amen. Let's sing.
We're going to continue to read through the Old Testament. We're in Isaiah uh, 49 this afternoon, the end of the last half of Isaiah 49. Brought back lots of memories of singing in your house, Carissa. Our old hymn sings years and years ago. Wow. Love that. We're beginning in Isaiah 14. This is the word of the Lord. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child? that She should have no compassion on the son of her womb. Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Your builders make haste. Your destroyers and those who laid you waste go out from you. Lift up your eyes around and see. They all gather. They come to you. As I live, declares the Lord, you shall put them all on as an ornament. You shall bind them on as a bride does. Surely your waste and your desolate places and your desolate a devastated land, surely now you will be too narrow for your inhabitants, and those who swallow you up will be far away. The children of your bereavement will yet say in your ears, The place is too narrow for me, make room for me to dwell in. Then you will say in your heart, Who has borne me these? I was bereaved and barren, exiled and put away, but who has brought up these? Behold, I was left alone. From where have these come? Thus says the Lord God. Behold, I will lift up my hand to the nations and raise my signal to the peoples. And they shall bring your sons in their arms and their daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. Kings shall be your foster fathers and their queens, your nursing mothers. Make their faces with their faces to the ground. They shall bow down to you and lick the dust of your feet. Then you will know. That I am the Lord. Those who wait for me shall not be put to shame. Can the prey be taken from the mighty? Or the captives of a tyrant be rescued? For thus says the Lord, Even the captives of the mighty shall be taken, And the prey of the tyrant be rescued. For I will contend with those who contend with you, And I will save your children. I will make your oppressors eat their own flesh. And they shall drink with their own blood as with wine. Then all flesh shall know that I am the Lord, your Savior, and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. My dear Christian friends, what is it that you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, from where he shall come to judge both the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Well, before Dr. Neuheiser comes again to bring us a message this afternoon, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Father, we're so grateful. Uh, the riches of your uh, Lord's Day as you provide to our souls the very essential uh, ministry of the Word. We're so thankful that it comes to us through the reading, uh, through the singing, through the preaching, through the prayers, through uh, your sacraments. Lord, it is a banquet that you provide for us every Lord's Day. Oh, Lord, may we, with the psalmist, declare that it is better to be in your courts than anywhere else. Lord, we uh, long uh, for all that you provide for us as we gather before you as your people. Lord, the richness, the beauty, the essential ministry to our hearts and minds. Oh, Lord, the fact that you have this pattern Seven days shows us our frailty and our weakness. Shows us that we are unable to sustain ourselves. That we are desperate for your ministry to us. And we're so thankful that in our frailty, you provide beautifully. 
Oh, Lord, we pray for this afternoon that uh, you would again uh, bring uh, your word to us through your preacher, that we would be receptive to hear it and to life. If there's any here unconverted, that they would come to life. They would see the glory of Christ and, and yield to it. Oh, Lord, for us that do believe, would you stir within us a great love for you that indeed would be the power of transformation from one degree of glory to another, that you would be uh, glorified and Christ would be exalted. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I think you're up. <laughs> Caroline and I are very happy that you all have an afternoon service or evening service as some would have it. Our church we've joined in Charlotte only has a morning service. We actually go to a different church on Sunday evenings. And actually, uh, the sermon I'm going to be preaching tonight was when they asked me to preach there because it was a Presbyterian church. They asked me for a short sermon. But Brian said that's appropriate on Sunday night, so or Sunday afternoon. So turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we're going to read verses 16 through 18. Charles Spurgeon, speaking of verse 17, says this is one of the most remarkable verses in all Scripture. Well-known commentator Philip Hughes says, we're on the threshold of one of the most important eschatological passages in the New Testament. Let me read it. Uh, verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart. But though our outward man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us, an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. For we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Amen. Now, I read that passage, and I said it was about eschatology. Eschatology means the study of last things, like Bible prophecy. And the first thing you say, well, what do you mean? I didn't hear anything about the rapture, the millennium. Uh, how could that be eschatological? Uh, when I was converted, now it's been almost 50 years ago, Bible prophecy was a very hot topic. It's never really quite ended. But uh, some of us will remember like the Left Behind book. Some of us who are older will remember Late Great Planet Earth. Uh, none of that is in here. Um, and yet... I want to call the message eschatological encouragement because as we look at the purpose of what the Bible says about the future and our hope, it's not about drawing a chart and arguing with your friends if they're dispensational and you're all millennial or whatever the differences may be. I'm not saying that's totally irrelevant. But if you look at the purpose of the passages in Scripture that talk about what is yet to come, it's meant to give hope. I, I mildly humorously said this morning that I have not preached all the way through the book of Revelation. I got about to chapter 5 and then I wasn't quite sure, but um, mildly humorous again. But um, I do know what Revelation is about. That the people who first read that in the first century were people who were suffering. And the book of Revelation was written to give them hope that Christ reigns on earth, he reigns in his church, and that glory is coming. And that's what this passage is doing as well. And actually, many years ago, I actually took a whole trip to the Bible in a year where I would try to look at every passage and what it says about eschatology, what it says about what we should expect in the future in terms of what's the purpose of this passage. I found two fundamental purposes. The first purpose is to motivate present obedience, like in 1 John chapter 3, where actually some of Jesus' parables where you don't know when the Master's going to come, like the virgins, and you've, you've got to always be ready. And so we should always be living in a state of readiness as if the Lord could come in at any time, and it's motivating present faithfulness. The other purpose, which I think is even more emphasized in the New Testament, is encouragement in the midst of great trouble, great suffering. And in this context, in 2 Corinthians, Paul is suffering in all kinds of different ways. Uh, earlier in this chapter, in verse 8, he said, We were afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, 
so that the life of Jesus might be manifest in our body. And then verse 11, so we who live are constantly being delivered over death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. And later on, you know, it's kind of like if you want to recruit people for the ministry, have them read 2 Corinthians 11, when Paul talks about shipwrecks and beatings. And he says, the hardest part is my concern for the churches. And so Paul is himself suffering. Believers to whom he's writing are suffering. And believers today suffer affliction. Actually, good eschatology will actually help you correct which is a doctrine, will help you to correct some bad doctrine. Uh, there's a bad doctrine saying you'll have your best life now. Well, you read about the life of Paul, you read about the life of the apostles, you read a lot about the life of faithful people in Hebrews 11, and eschatology says <clears throat> your best life is later, and you may have a good life now being in Christ, but it's not necessarily going to be one of health and wealth and popularity. The Word of God acknowledges our present suffering, and it encourages us in our suffering with the hope that we have. And as Doug and some others in your church do counseling, I find eschatology to be a very important subject while I'm counseling with people. We had a man in our church in North Carolina who had a wife and two sons who were coming into young adulthood, and he had cancer. He had a seven-year battle with cancer. At about the age of 50, he recently passed away. What do you say to those sons? What do you say to that wife? Uh, you have, I have another friend, and his wife, with whom he's been married for over 50 years, has Alzheimer's disease, and she barely recognizes him. He, she no longer recognizes uh, the children. It's a full-time job for her to be, for him to be her caregiver. Um, Sometimes when you're going through those things, you keep thinking this could be the same thing with sickness. And we've had recently family members, and they're going through the process of dying. And you're accustomed in life saying, well, they'll find a cure or things will get better. And sometimes you're just watching the process of what sin has done to humanity take yet another life. You talk to a, a woman who is middle-aged, and she spent her childhood thinking about when Prince Charming would come and sweep her off her feet. And she goes through young adulthood, and Prince Charming does not come. And as the sand of her youth is trickling through the hourglass of time, now she's beyond having children. Ten times a bridesmaid, never a bride. And uh, she's happy to be a part of the church community, but she's lonely, and life hasn't really produced everything that she was looking forward to. Or... Uh, the other woman, and yeah, she got married, and she'd trade places with the lady I just mentioned. And her marriage has been a hard marriage. And Caroline actually is a talk she gives to women called The Lonely Wife. And you could be married and still lonely. Um, you know, families we talked about in the conference where there are children in whom they've invested so much, and they go into adulthood, and they turn from the faith, or they even turn to a, a lifestyle that brings shame to and, and sadness to the parents. And then, I just think I mentioned this morning, being in China and hearing of pastors there being thrown in jail and kept from their families. Uh, think of seminaries in, a seminary in Ukraine and the thing's been blown up and you know, people are dying and uh, I think from our time in Saudi Arabia, what Islamic law is like when it takes over from our experience there where our meetings were illegal and think of what's happened in Afghanistan. So there are awful things. And the, the, Paul begins the passage saying, therefore we do not lose heart. Maybe after hearing me describe all that stuff, you are losing heart. Um, you can see how that could happen. But then he gives us three contrasts. And he's saying that you don't lose heart because your outward the decaying self is presently already being inwardly renewed. Your, your present suffering is producing a, a weight of future glory that is surpassing, and that your focus is turning away from what is seen and temporal to what is unseen and eternal. Now each, in, in one sense, he's saying the same thing three different ways to encourage us. And so, verse 16 again, therefore we do not lose heart, though our outer man is decaying. Yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Now, 
as I have entered into my 60s, I'm getting more and more what the Bible means when it describes the outer man decaying. Uh, you think about when the Olympics happened a few months ago, and you see people who spend their lives uh, for years and years trying to train their bodies to be able to run or jump or do other such things. And yet, uh, when is it Allison Felix in her mid-30s is able to compete, people marvel. Well, that's still pretty young, but past their prime. Um, you think of the the American dream the eschatological hope, speaking a bit sarcastically, of many people is you save enough money so you can quit working. And then you can play golf or play bridge or read books, pickleball, whatever it may be. But what happens? Your body is wasting away and you're spending more time with the doctors than at the swimming pool. Uh, my cardiologist says, no more marathons for you. Um, it actually could be a counterfeit hope. Uh, last weekend I was actually visiting my mom in a retirement community. I'm not against retirement community. But getting old stinks. Seeing the body waste away. Yet even here, he's not just talking about our, our physical bodies, but I think he's also just saying that this present world is in a state of decay. And everything is deteriorating. Nothing lasts. And it's, it's subject to this decay. It's destined, as 2 Peter 3 says, for destruction in our own bodies. We, we can't stop it with medicine or insurance or surgery. We can't stop it with technology. Again, it'd be easy to see how one could lose heart. You could lose heart when you see that sometimes it seems like the, the very people who are the most godly are the ones who suffer the most. When you see people who are faithful in other countries who get thrown in jail. You see even in this country now or in the West, you see mild persecution beginning over believers who don't toe the line culturally. I was surprised to see there's a case of a woman who was a former government minister in Finland who apparently is an evangelical Christian who was on trial for hate speech for basically quoting what the Bible says about sexual issues in marriage. And you know it just seems like we're losing. And yet, looking at the outward is a mistake. Uh, when the Lord Jesus was on the cross, it appeared he was the most cursed of all. His body was subject to death. And yet, God had a purpose in it. Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. From outward appearance, it would seem that he was the most pathetic of men. He was despised and rejected of men. He had no winsomeness, no beautiful form that people would be drawn to him. We appear to be the losers in the world. And yet, the other half of the verse is, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. And Galatians 1 says we've been rescued from this evil age. That this, is, this age is what is passing away. And we're already participating in the age to come. In chapter 3, verse 18, Paul it brought this out. Now we all with unveiled face behold as a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed to the same image from glory to glory even as the Lord the Spirit. Calvin writes that in proportion as the earthly life declines so does the heavenly life advance. For the reprobate man too the outward man decays but without anything to compensate for it. Now I want to give you an illustration and I don't know if any of you have ever read the, the, the novel or watched one of the movies, I hope you watched the old one, not the new one, of the picture of Dorian Gray. Are you familiar with that story? It's of a man who was a handsome gentleman, and he had a friend who was a great artist, and I know we have artists in the room, because I've seen some of their work, and his friend, who is the great artist, painted his portrait, and this Dorian Gray was like the most beautiful, handsome man in his prime of life, and he says, how sad I shall grow old and horrible, but this picture will never be older. If it were, I was the, always be young and the picture was to go old, I would give my soul for that. And so as the story goes, that this man, Dorian Gray, his appearance, he continues to look like he's in his mid-twenties while all of his friends around him age. Uh, he stays handsome and robust, and yet he becomes an evil man. 
and he hurts others. He actually ends up killing his friend who painted the picture. He blackmails people. He misuses women. And so in the story, what's going on is he took that portrait. And actually, the artist wanted his portrait back to display it, and Dorian Gray wouldn't let him have it. But in the, in the story, that Dorian Gray had taken that painting and hidden it away in a room. And while Dorian Gray was staying the same, the painting not only was aging, but also the corruption of his soul was reflected, so it looked like a monstrous man getting old and being ultra, utter, utterly pathetic. And what Paul is saying is we are the opposite, in a sense, well, of, of Dorian Gray, in that the world looks at us, and it looks like we're getting older and weaker. They look at us in culture, and it looks like Christianity is in decline, and that uh, evangelical church is in decline, and we're the, the, the worthless nothing and nobodies in the world. And yet, there's a reality in heaven, a portrait of us in heaven, that day by day is being renewed and becoming more beautiful, more robust, stronger, and more wonderful. And so it is exactly the opposite. By the way, if you watch the movie, watch the one with Angela Lansbury in the 40s. Uh, so first point of hope and eschatological encouragement is that our outer person is decaying. But we have this inner person, a life hidden with Christ in heaven, that day by day is becoming renewed and is more glorious. And that is a great hope. How hard it would be, like Calvin says, how hard it would be not to have that hope. Just to see this life gradually wasting away with nothing beyond. But then there's a second encouragement, and that is in verse 17, that your present affliction is already producing a way to your future glory. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Now, we need to understand how the scripture often speaks in situations like this. Paul is not denying that our present suffering uh, could be, you know, he's not saying it's not sometimes intense and weighty. Virgin writes, perhaps someone thoughtlessly says, well, whoever calls affliction light must have been a person who knew very little about what affliction really is. But then Hodge points out, remember who is saying this and under what circumstances. This is Paul who takes beatings. This is Paul who is uh, shipwrecked. This is Paul who even nominal Christians, people who claim to be on his side, uh, cause him harm. He's slandered by false teachers, persecuted by enemies of the gospel, unappreciated by the Corinthians for whose life he's poured out his soul. He's got bullets coming from all directions. Again, we believers today in Acts, uh, the apostles said, through many sufferings, we must enter into the kingdom of God. And we have some affliction just in the ordinary course of this world. We have some affliction because of our connections to Christ. I speak to our young people, to our children. As you get older, you're going to realize, if you're a believer, that you are unusual. You're different. You're different from the people in the world. They believe different things. They value different things. And as you get older, you're going to have to make up your mind whether what your parents have taught you and your pastors have taught you is something you really believe for yourself. But it's not going to be easy. People may tease you because you love the Lord. People may bully you because you love the Lord. Uh, there is often a cost to following Christ. Uh, and as our culture becomes more and more post-Christian, uh, these things will become more severe. Uh, some of us as believers come from families that weren't Christian. And uh, some have been shunned and disowned. Some, our families just think we're a bit nutty, kind of religious fanatic. Why aren't you at home watching TV or outside and you're in church on Sunday afternoon? Why would that be? Well, because this is where I want to be. This is the best way to spend the day. But we seem a bit kooky to them. Sometimes it can even be worse where our family members adopt values where when they, learn, when they learn we believe, they don't even want to be around us. Uh, sometimes it can even be fellow Christians or fellow professing Christians, just like Paul. The wounds that were worse for Paul were probably the wounds that hit him from the back. When and you read it in Second uh, Timothy four, how you know no one supported him in his trial, and how people he had trusted betrayed him and let him down, and uh, there's all kinds of suffering and and grief and sadness, and so there's not a denial that our suffering is great, 
And it's actually how the Bible often speaks. It's, uh, Romans 8.18 says, For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And so, actually the word glory in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word, means weighty, something heavy. So children, can you think of a heavy, heavy animal? What's a heavy animal? I think an elephant is a pretty heavy am- animal. So there's a couple ways you could illustrate this with an elephant. You could say that our present sufferings are like a feather. You put that on a scale and an elephant is on the other side, which is the glory we're going to have when we're in the presence of Christ. And even though it's just that much more. And yet, as I thought about it, I realized our sufferings aren't like a feather. Some of us tonight don't have feather-like suffering. We have elephant-like suffering. So I had to fix my illustration. Now I'll say your sufferings are the elephant. But on the other side of the scale, you're going to put an aircraft carrier. And compared to an aircraft carrier, an elephant is light. You could fit a whole bunch of them, or an ark or something, whatever. And that the, the idea being that there's not a denial that our present suffering is really hard. There's hardship in this life. That's why we need a verse like this. Is people break our hearts sometimes. We suffer physically. Sometimes watching people we love who who mess up their lives and, and there's nothing we can do it's just like watching a disaster from a distance and yet there's greater glory and in Hebrews 12 again speaking of Christ and, and Paul as he's talking to the Hebrews about some of the suffering they're experiencing he tells us to fix our eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Did Jesus suffer a little bit or a lot? A lot. And yet the joy that he anticipated, which remarkably was saving us in obedience to the Father, to the glory of the Father, the joy of saving us, the joy of what was beyond the cross, enabled him to endure the cross and despise the shame. And that is, that's the steps in which we are following. Not a, a life of no suffering. A life when the suffering seems to be so intense we can hardly stand it. To realize my suffering may feel like an elephant worth of suffering. But there's an aircraft carrier on the other side of glory that will surpass all of that. Virgin also points out that our suffering now is light compared to what we deserve. As Psalm 103 says, he does not treat us as our sins deserve. It's also light compared with the sufferings our Lord suffered for us so that we would not suffer the sufferings, the, the sorrows we deserve. There's one more part of verse 17 though I want to point out. Because the way I've described it so far, you almost think, well, suffering is happening now. And the first real experience of the glory is going to be later. But the language here is something is presently going on. He says, our suffering, our light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. But it is producing. There's something going on right now. It's it's, it's God is is using our, our, our suffering, our trials, that, again, analogies, what can work, but it's like, like a mining operation and gold is being dug up. It's it's like a manufacturing plant where glory is being produced day after day after day after day, uh, awaiting you know, this treasure awaiting us in heaven and ultimately to the glory of God. If I had more millennials here, I'd say like Bitcoin mining or something. You've got the computer churning away trying to spit out those Bitcoins. Well, right now, there's productivity going on. Your suffering is, is not wasted, it's productive. First Peter 4 um, 12 and 13. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. But to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that the revelation of his glory, you too may rejoice with exaltation. And so, not all suffering, by the way, not all suffering is productive this way. It's the suffering that's done. Uh, not as a wrongdoer, as Peter says, but the suffering which is done as we follow Christ. 
And that gives us hope that while the suffering seems hard, the loneliness, the pain, the betrayal, even the persecution, that we have something really wonderful to look forward to. Uh, One of my earliest memories as a Christian would have been in 1973, and I had some friends who invited me to a conference, and I'd never before heard Amazing Grace. At least I never noticed it. And when they sang that verse, like we did this morning, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining is the sun. We have no less days to sing God's praise than when we first began. That this life, even with its difficulties, is so short compared to the glory we will have in the presence of Christ. So we don't lose heart. Because right now, our inner man is being renewed. While the outer man is decaying, like the Dorian Gray thing, the, the, the hidden portrait of who we really are is, is becoming more beautiful and glorious. And then the, the affliction we have now is not wasted affliction. As we, as we endure to the glory of God like Christ, it's, be, it's a productive affliction that's going to produce such glory in the presence of Christ that we will look back upon our previous affliction as, as light suffering. And then finally, uh, uh, the last contrast would be in verse 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And so our focus is already turned. Again, there's so much in this passage. It's not merely future. Sometimes things are going to get better. But right now, our eyes have been diverted. And children, have you ever been with your mom, maybe something came on television and she said, look away. Or you're out in public and whatever, and they said, don't look, turn away, look away. Well, that's kind of what Paul is saying. Stop looking at that thing. I've got something better for you to look at. We're tempted to put our focus on our present trouble and in this present life. And instead, our focus needs to be elsewhere. Because these earthly experiences are really in contrast. They're contrary to uh, heavenly realities. We we live in a world which says that outward beauty and pleasure and material possessions and earthly popularity are what really matter. And that's all what's seen. Just like Dorian Gray, living for that, living for whatever the world has to offer. And, and when you have the right perspective, Paul is saying, you stop looking at all that stuff because it's all going to burn up anyway. And you, you turn your eyes in the other direction. And even the, the, the point of the contrast is, this is all temporary. One day, it won't matter. I mean, even in this life, right, the, the great athlete of 20 years ago is using a walker today if he's still alive sometimes. That he's certainly not ordinarily playing the sport again. Is it? The, the glories of the great beauty of 40 years ago, mm, all the surgery in the world hasn't been able to maintain that beauty. It, it's, it's all temporal. It's passing away. It, it reminds me in Psalm 73 when the psalmist confesses, I was tempted to envy the wicked because everything seems to go their way until I came into the presence of God and I saw their end. The people in the world who seem to be prospering, the people who are living for wealth and pleasure and the follies of this world who seem to be winning, who seem to be popular, who seem to have all the power, they are but a moment. They're like the grass that's going to pass away. And thanks be to God, that's not us. We fix our eyes on eternal realities. It's what the author of the Hebrews says in chapter 11 about even those who suffered or even died in faith, how they were looking ahead to a future city that now we are beginning to experience because Christ has come and yet has a a, a glorious future. Um, One of my favorite passages uh, in all of Scripture is 1 John chapter 3, the first couple verses. How great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God, and such we are. This reason the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared as what yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him, because we will see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on Him purifies himself just as He is pure. See, here we are. 
We are the children of God who are richly blessed, who have a great inheritance. And the world doesn't recognize that. They think we're a bunch of worthless nobodies. But who cares? One day, we will see Christ face to face. And when we do, and this is what I love about this verse, is we will be like Him. What could be more glorious than that? No more sin. No more sorrow. No more suffering. Have perfectly pure desires. That's what He's purchased for us on the cross. Not just our forgiveness. He's purchased our glorification. And it will, 10,000 years, as the hymn says, will just be the beginning of the glory that He's gained for us. You know, when Jesus was tempted, the, the devil offered Him an earthly glory of the kingdoms of the earth. And He turned that down to obtain everlasting glory and obedience to the Father. We need to look at it the same way. The unseen realities are vastly superior. That's why, as he continues in the next chapter, we walk by faith and not by sight. That the unseen realities are more important to us and more real to us because they're eternal and glorious as opposed to the seen, the mist that we're around. And the, and the world in its blindness goes on as it is. Um, and again, this is practical eschatology. How do we encourage others? You can't always say, don't worry, be happy. You can't always say, things are going to get better. Sometimes really hard things happen. And we have elephant-sized problems. And we don't have an immediate solution. We have a hope beyond this life. We have a God who is sovereign and is even using our trouble, as verse 17 says, to manufacture more glory. It makes the hardship bearable. Um, uh, Mark Richt, who was the former Georgia and then Miami football head coach, revealed not long ago on Twitter that he had been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And he's a professing Christian. He says, truthfully, I look upon it as a momentary light affliction compared to the future glory in heaven. Thank you, Jesus, for promising us a future blessing of a glorified body that has no sin and no disease. And so, again, that is the ultimate answer. Don't lose heart because there are spiritual realities. We're already beginning to enjoy a taste of the world to come by God's work in us. Our present sufferings are meaningful and productive. If we fix our eyes on those truths, we have hope. And I, Just one more passage in Colossians 3. Therefore, since you have been raised up with Christ, seek, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you will be revealed with Him in glory. That is life-transforming truth. And yet, if you've never personally trusted Christ for yourself, not yet for you, I would encourage you, consider the brevity of this life. Consider that after death comes judgment. Consider that what people are living for now one day is all going to be burned up. Yet Christ has come into the world to pay a great price, great suffering. All who believe in Him might be forgiven and transformed. He offers you really to be what we are supposed to be as human beings, to be servants of God and to share His glory by His grace. There's nothing better the world has to offer than that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I don't know the suffering of each person here and the suffering each one of us is coming into contact with, with people in our lives. But I thank you for the hope of your word and the power of your word that you gave us passages like this to encourage us, strengthen us, to give us wisdom, help us to grasp these realities, help us to appropriate them by faith. We thank you for the hope we have in Christ no matter what's happening to us externally, that there is a reality in heaven that is everlasting and glorious. We pray this in the name of our Savior. Amen.
Tennessee. Last night, uh, Steve and I were talking, and he said that one of the most encouraging things, components of the gospel is this, that we see in John 20, where after the disciples had abandoned and fled and hid at the uh, crucifixion, uh, Jesus comes to them, and he gathers among them, and he says, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And uh, that's really what we have on the Lord's Day. Even though we struggle throughout the week and we, we don't get it right and we're still burdened. And uh, the Lord still meets with his people. And he says, peace be with you as we gather. And then he shows us his hands and his side. He shows us the glory of himself throughout the Lord's Day. And then... Uh, this passage finishes up in 21. It says, Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And uh, that he sends us out with that same peace and love. That uh, he has met with us and encouraged us and shown himself through the preaching of the word. And it does encourage us. And then he sends us out with his blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. You're dismissed.